Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome back to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast Summer Short Series where we are getting the super nerdy details on specific subjects all summer long while we gear up for Season 3 of the podcast in the October. So, those insect hotels, do they work? Are they a good idea? Can native bees be predatory? How are native bees different from regular bees? Well, my guest, Dr. Alex Harmon 3, has some thoughts. Because... Pollinator and native bees is kind of her thing. Alex runs the Harmon Threat Lab at the University of Illinois, which focuses on pollination ecology, conservation, and restoration. And she's on today to talk bees, native bees, and pollinators. And if you know me, you know I love me some bugs. So this was super fascinating and fun for me. Um, and also a super helpful conversation in understanding native pollinators and how to increase their numbers. And I could not bring it to you without the help of you our Patreon members at patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. Oh, and we have hats up over there now for the time being. Um, if you missed out on the first no-till hats that first time, um, you can purchase one over there right now. No weird tier or anything, just they're up for sale. Um, they are currently only available for a limited time, and um, Patreon members get first dibs. So patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. You just have to be a member, $2 a month, 5 whatever you can afford. Anyway, if you want to support this work, or frankly could care less about the work, but you really want one of those hats, cool, go to patreon.com slash farmerjesse and sign up where, at a certain level, or if you just bump up your patronage from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So, big shout outs this week to Travis and Heidi of Arcadia Acres, Judson Taylor, Seeds and Soil Farm, Mark andre Giroux, John Mills, Michael Madden, Jacob Arthur, Eric Posh, Clara Coleman, Wild Mountain Seeds, Liam Miller, Bob and Ann Patton, Jared Kirst, Jay Armour, Eric Schlelner, Dan Breezebois, C. Mac Small, Jay McCombs, Adam Hensley, Tim Baldwin, Kevin Keane, Grant Timms, Esoterra Culinary, Patricia Jones, Steve Larson, Fiona and Donnie of Firefly Farm, Ryan Goser, Jean Martin Fortier, Yannick Laplante, Clinton Dobbs, Marcus Ochoa, Andrew Cousins, or Cousins, let me know, Andrew, Jennifer Sly. Thanks to all of our supporters. Uh, and if you ever just want to kick us a couple bucks and say thanks for that show, it was super awesome, you can go to Venmo and we're at No Till Growers. That is always much appreciated. All right, enough from me. Let's get into some pollinator nerdiness with Dr. Alex Harmon Threat of the Harmon Threat Lab. Dr. Harmon Three, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, let's dive right in. In terms of habitat, can you give us an idea of what are some basic what are some basic differences between sort of where native bees live and where honeybees live? Yeah, so um, you know, everyone growing up learns a lot about honeybees, uh, but I'd like to remind people that honeybees actually have a very obscure ecology and biology. They're very different from most of the bees that are uh, native to this land. So honeybees originally are from Europe. Um, they like to let nest in originally kind of large cavities, so like a, a big hole in a tree would be a good uh, honeybee uh, habitat or, or nesting site. We've been able to convince them to live in boxes, right, which makes them really good for being able to move around, to be able to harvest honey. But native bees, um, most of which are actually solitary, so you're going to have a single female uh, making a nest, provisioning that nest with pollen and nectar, and then stealing it. That means they don't actually make honey in most cases, or what we think of as traditional honey. There are some native species that make kind of a honey-ish thing, um, but I won't get into that too much. And they, so there's these solitary females. They're making these small nests. Um, the, most of the time, you're not going to get these huge densities that you get with honeybees, and we also lack the ability really to move them around. And so that means making habitat in local areas is really important for their survival and fitness and um, ability to pollinate local flowers and crops um, because we don't have the ability to keep them in boxes and manipulate them and supplement them in that same way. So we have to supplement them basically with the environment. Okay, that's great. I, and, I, and I want to talk about supplementing it with the environment, but I also kind of want to know like if if they're not living in boxes, where are these nests? Are these primarily in the ground? Are they in trees? Or 
Yeah, so they can use all of those habitats. Um, predominantly, they nest in the soil, and that's really what a big part of my work is, is understanding what is happening to them um, when they're nesting below ground. And that makes studying them actually super hard because we, we know about 80% of all native species are nesting in the soil. But, you know, the soil is a literal black box. You can't, it's very hard to know how many are down there. You know, are they dying from things like mold or are they dying from things like pesticides? That's really difficult for us to disentangle. But you do have some that also live in cavities. And I know a lot of people have little bee houses. Those are really popular um, for the last decade or so with little drilled holes in them. And those are called cavity nesting bees. And they will use those habitats, um, you know, little uh, small round openings uh, that they would normally actually they would probably use a lot of reeds or beetle holes but you know we can make uh, fake houses for those um, and then some larger bees will nest in trees or soft wood on the ground it's funny you bring up those insect hotels or houses are are those pretty effective for increasing habitat or do we know um yes and no so we know that they are readily colonized uh, by local cavity nesting bees in your area. But we also know that they can really build up a lot of pests and parasites because in a natural environment, a bee probably wouldn't be using the same home over and over and over again, right? Like they'd use a reed, that reed would probably break down over the course of the next year or two. So it wouldn't be consistently available. Um, and so there is a lot of concern that what we actually are doing is just building up pests and parasites in the environment in their, like in these nests rather than actually doing a lot of facilitating of their um, increasing uh, their numbers. So there's been some movement to try and have people either use some kind of a liner, like a paper liner that you could actually take out every year so that you don't have this buildup of pests and parasites. Um, or you could uh, put out, you, I was just actually reading something today about people just uh, cutting the reeds from their flowers in their yard and just leaving them. So if you have a lot of native plants growing in your yard, rather than cutting those down and throwing them all away, you could actually either leave them standing or cut them and leave them in a pile and then throw, the, you know, throw them away at the end of the next year. Because that would really help. These temporary houses would be really helpful to preventing the spread of disease. Uh, because they still need places to nest, but uh, there is some concern about those bee houses. Right. Yeah, that is super fascinating. So in some ways, there's two thoughts that kind of come to mind is like, one, it, when, when you're doing a lot of no-till growing, a lot of growers use, um, you know, different mulches and those sorts of things. And it's been known to find uh, nests like of uh, wasps, uh, ground hornets, and those sorts of things in the, in the mulches. Um, but also maybe some of those native pollinators are using that mulch, those reeds that are left. Would that probably be accurate? Um, I guess it would depend on the type of mulch. Um, in general, for since most bees are ground nesting, they actually seem to like really bare patches of, gr of uh, ground. And so heavy mulches would actually be pretty bad for m many species of native bees. But that said, there are some like bumblebees and other species that would love a, a pile of mulch to kind of dig into and make a make a, a nest for themselves. So um, it feels like it, in some ways, if there's a, a nesting niche to be filled, they, they all have been filled. And there are many species that will nest in all kinds of um, areas and under all kinds of um, situations. But certainly, since most bees are ground nesting, having bare patches of soil are actually really important for them. Wow, that's interesting. Um, another thing I was wondering, I guess, the other part of that last question that I was thinking about was, are there specific grasses that they're attracted to? Um, you said reeds. Is that yeah. something that you often encourage people to maybe plant more of? Um, any, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be a grass. It just needs to be any kind of a stem, um, particularly ho hollow or pithy stems that are, you know, kind of soft. They need those, and I would just say a variety of sizes because bees come in all kinds of sizes. So, you know, plants that are going to have really thin um, stalks as well as some that are going to have kind of fatter stalks are really useful for them because they just come in so many sizes and shapes that we need, they need something that's good. They, they pretend to like something that's going to be closer to their actual body size. Um, and a lot of that seems to have to do with them just not having to. Uh, 
adapt the hole as much. So if a, if a hole is too big, then they actually need to like pack, they like to pack, they often will pack it with various materials to make it closer to the size that they need. So it's, the closer it actually is, then they have a lot less work to do, which is really efficient for them because they can usually only provision about one cell a day. So on a, on a great, wonderful, beautiful day, right? So when there's lots of flowers available, they can only lay one egg and provision one cell, which means that time is really, really critical for them. If you, if, you know, bad weather or anything that causes delays, anything they have to expend a lot of energy on means uh, fewer cells being provisioned, and that means fewer bees in the future. Right. How many, how many different species are we kind of looking at in terms of native bees? Yeah, so uh, globally, there are about 20,000 species of bees. In the U.S., there are about 4,000 species. And in Illinois, where I live, um, we've even determined that there's probably about uh, 450 to 500 species. Some of those were records that we're still trying to dig out and figure out if they were accurate or not. But so it's actually quite high um, bee uh, diversity. Yeah, that's... Uh, in when you're talking, when we're talking about native bees, are we including wasps, like native wasps no, as well? No, we're not okay. including wasps. So are the, do wasps and bees make up the majority of pollinators? Well, I mean, they're butterflies and flies also. Um, bees are, ten, are really considered the heavy lifters in pollination, mostly because they're really well designed for it. Right? They're hairy bodies. Um, they're able to get pollen stuck to them and move that pollen uh, really efficiently, as opposed to other species, including wasps. The so wasps, um, flies, and butterflies really aren't very hairy, particularly the parts that attach the, um, touch the flowers, the uh, stamen and anthers. So that is really the part that's going to be important for them to be transmitting pollen or transferring pollen to uh, between flowers. So. That's why bees are considered really much more efficient at it than most other uh, pollinators, even though there are lots of other things that, poll that, that pollinate flowers, including all kinds of gnats and beetles and, you know, m mammals and birds and all kinds of things. Is it a mixture between where they're generally living is in forest land or in grassland or does that make sense? Like, is it, do they prefer par prairies to forests, I guess would be my question. Um, I don't know. I prefer is difficult to uh, state. There are, I would say, conditions that are probably more favorable in sunnier locations, places that are going to be. One of that is about how dry it is. Forest floors tend to be very wet, and moisture is both um, a huge help to bees, but also a, a huge hindrance, because one of the biggest things that affects bees that nest in the ground is mold growth. So, um, and parasites that live in the soil, which do better in really uh, wet conditions. So, um, and in most forests, you don't, you tend not to have a lot of flowering plants kind of throughout the entire season. So, you know, they have a lot of spring ephemerals, but then not a lot during the summer. Um, and that means that they are restricted possibly in nest site, but then probably also really significantly uh, with, for, with uh, forage, uh, flowers for forage. Right, that makes sense. I mean, if it's, if Pat, you know, you think of the forest as a really fungally dominated soil. So yeah, that would probably be less advantageous for them setting up shop. Yeah. Um, native bees as uh, predatory, are they predatory at all? Uh, we definitely have uh, parasitic bees that prey on each other. So uh, bees that will kind of sneak into another's nest and lay uh, an egg kind of that will ultimately kill the original uh, hatch and kill the original egg and consume the pollen ball. So there are definitely bee predators. Uh, they tend mostly only to prey on other bees and not in the, um, I guess, not in the same sense as, you know, a, a two adult animals eating each other, more in the, uh, almost like the larval babies are eating <laughs> each other. Right. But it's rare that you would find a bee that would necessarily eat like a, I don't know, some sort of pest off of a, I'm thinking of like lace wings eating aphids. Um, right. Are there honey, are there native bees that do much in that way? Like are there, they're uh, predatory towards garden pests or um, something to that effect? Not 
so much in North Amer not so much in North America, but you get some really interesting things happening in the tropics. Um, bees that seem to eat carrion and other things. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> not uh, or yeah, but not uh, not so much in North America. And then, can you talk a little bit about how about pollination and um, how that works in terms of like? I think I read a study once that talked about how native bees, the presence of native bees actually makes honeybees more efficient and more effective. Like, can you talk about pollination and competition? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, pollination, if you, I always think of it kind of, I like to explain it as like, it's kind of a happy accident, right? So a bee is just trying to, they're trying to forage to feed themselves and feed the larvae. And in that process of them, you know, serving themselves, pollen gets stuck to their body, and then that pollen is transferred to the next flower that they visit. Now, ideally for the plant, when it's being transferred to that next plant, that next flower, that flower is of the same species and not, you know, super closely related to um, to itself, right? So you, if you if you transfer pollen between two seeds that came from the same uh, plant, they're closely related. That's, you know, not really great for gene flow. Right. So if we think of that as like kind of the happy accident that's happening, um, it's better for a bee to move long distances so that your, your pollen is moving to someone that's more likely to be um, not, uh, not related to you. Uh, and that's something that actually native bees are better at than honeybees. Honeybees are actually very meticulous in their flower visitation and pollen collection. So they're more likely to visit many flowers on the same plant, like very um, in, in a short period of time, right? Meaning that they're mostly moving pollen kind of within a plant rather than between plants. Um, and like I said, they're very meticulous. So they're going to kind of go down the row. But competition, so when you have other bees in that system, it actually causes them to alter that behavior and move out, you know, instead of moving straight up and down a, uh, a flowering head, they may move then to the next plant or maybe move further away, which really helps facilitate that pollination part. Now, native bees overall are often considered better pollinators than honeybees because they are, they are meticulous in their own way, but they're more likely to actually move um, further distances or between different flowers rather than within the same flower. Um, and if you actually watch bees in your yard, you'll notice the difference in the behavior with how honeybees really will very um, meticulously kind of go around and around the same flower head and then before they move to the next one. But a, honey, uh, a native bee might come, visit, and then immediately fly away, fly to something further away. Uh, and that's really where the pollination magic happens. That's funny because it makes me think about how hard your job is because I've tried to take pictures of native bees before and a honeybee is easy, but a native bee is so hard that that kind of explains it for me. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exact. That's a perfect uh, uh, analogy for like, if you think about how hard it is to photograph them, <laughs> that's, you know, that's, uh, that's really the difference in uh, pollination as part of that because honeybees could really care less about you and the native bees like the minute they get startled by a shadow or something else uh, um, they you know they will often will you know kind of move really quickly to another plant um, and that's where the pollination is happening. So in terms of flowers like I I think about you know garden flowers um, what are some of the native bees favorite things in terms of pollinators? Uh, or in ter terms of flowers, like um, trees, grasses, um, what are some things that maybe we could be planting that would encourage more native people? Yeah, so um, they will visit trees and grasses, especially early in the season. They will be, uh, many species that are flying then are, are, will special, even specialize on tree pollen. Uh, the biggest thing that I'd like to emphasize to people is diversity. Like you need lots of different flower types blooming at lots of different points in the year and that's really uh the important thing for facilitating native native bees in your yard or at your home or on your farm is just making sure that you have food available to them all throughout the kind of growing season now native plants are obviously really great for um 
great for them because that's what they have co evolved with. That's what they're most accustomed to handling and dealing with. Um, but I know that, you know, for various reasons, native plants may not work for everyone. I have this problem at my own house because I live um, up on the corner and uh, all of my native plants get too tall and I get cited by the city every year <laughs> about how tall they are. Um, and so I've been looking, uh, one of the projects that we're running right now is trying to really understand are there cultivars or um, ornamentals that actually would help facilitate uh, more native, um, help support native pollinators, but maybe don't grow quite as tall. Um, so even with that, if you if you have to have ornamentals, I would say things that are going to have really what I call open morphology. So um, we often breed flowers to have a lot of petals, but those petals actually make it really difficult to access the pollen and nectar. Um, nectar parts of the of the flower, and so that can actually reduce their the access that bees have to them. Um, and then also just looking at your yard and seeing what thing, what bees are visiting and saying like, oh, I should plant more of that. I definitely have um, some ornamental plants or bulbs that are in my yard that I'll, I would just happen to see a lot of bees really flocking to and say, oh, next year I'm going to put more of that in. Um, they really like things like salvias. Um, a lot of herbs are actually very good for bees. They seem to like those quite a lot. Um, and sedums, things, I mean, like I, do, I find them on all kinds of things in my yard. And then I say, oh, okay, I'll put some more of that in. And so even if you just kind of did that as an iterative process to say, oh, this seems to, they seem to like this, let them make the choice. Put out lots of diversity, let them make the choice, and then replicate on things that seem to be doing well. Yeah, that's great. I've noticed that they love time our time always flowers in the spring um and the, and and it mm -hmm. just gets covered with bees and flies um yeah medicinally are they using like uh, i think about um you know honeybees using sunflowers medicinally is that something that native i'm assuming that's something that native bees to do too do we know much about that so yeah so they uh, native bees do seem to use uh, plants medicinally, and there's some great uh, recent research coming out of UMass Amherst and Lynn Adler's group, where she's and her group have been able to kind of test out like this, how bees can use the suite of plants that are available to them to help treat infections or prevent infections, and how important that is. And this is one of the reasons that diversity is really critical for plant for bees. It's because a single plant might provide some of the nutri nutrition that they need, but maybe not all of it. And so you really have to offer lots of things to them to allow them to kind of live their uh, best lives, right? So I always tell people, it, you can survive if you only ate corn, but you might end up with like some other weird micronutrient deficient, deficiencies, right? So it, we don't know, we know a little bit about those kinds of things in bees, but being able to provide them with lots of options really helps them meet their own dietary requirements. Right. And I'm assuming, because I see insect populations dropping um, in the news and, and read several articles about it, um, are we seeing that a lot with native bees as well? Yeah, we have seen a lot of declines in native, native bees and native pollinators and insects in general. And a lot of that seems to have to do with this loss of habitat and loss of you know, foraging resources and being able to make these kind of important decisions about, um, you know, what foods are good for them. Certainly there are other things that are contributing to that. Um, but I think habitat loss is really one of the big ones, right? Because even if you think about uh, pesticide use, pesticides are obviously, they're bad for insects because that's what they're meant to kill them. But um, if you had more habitat that, that they could access that was pesticide free, um, that would provide a lot of um, resources for them and safe havens and things like that. So those things aren't really decoupled. You know, habitat fragmentation and pesticide use, those things are actually really um, intimately um, intertwined. And is there anything we missed in terms of, like, creating better habitat? I, I think the thing I, ha I always like, you know, there are two things that everyone needs to survive. It's food and it's um, housing, right? And those two things, like if we can find ways to provide those for native bees, um, that really will help uh, boost their population sizes uh, and, you know, provide the service that we really need. So any anything you can do for them to increase those two things is going to be a win. Piles of trees, 
keeping the reed grasses and the reeds of flowers and those sorts of things on the ground. Um, maybe building those insect houses as long as you're cleaning them up. Uh, anything else that I'm missing? Uh, bare spots in your in your yard. Um, anywhere you can provide just like open places with a little vegetation and little um, mulch is really critical since most of the bees are nesting in the ground. Planting as many plants of a variety of types, especially if they're native, if you can find them and tolerate their height. Um, I think those are the things I would add. That's great. Well, Alex, thank you so much for your time. No problem. I'm, I'm glad you, we were able to chat and I was able to share some of my love for bees with people. All right, if you enjoyed that conversation, make sure to keep an eye on Alex's work. You can follow the Harmon 3 Lab on Twitter at the HT Lab. You can also donate to their work. I'll link their website, or you can Google Harmon 3 Lab. It's there too. Um, make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you are getting it. Rate and review it. Huge thank you to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for their help. Also, my wife Hannah, super awesome ton of help behind the scenes. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.